In the previous episode, I spoke of psychohistory and of the prime radiant. And now to continue where I left off. I'd like to plagiarize these two terms from Mr. Isaac Asimov. I hope he would be flattered and not offended. Psychohistory sounds like the best name for the study of our mental evolution. I'd like to borrow the prime radiant as well, since we desperately need something like a first principle, formula-based structure that would do for the science of morality what the periodic table did for the science of chemistry. So if we want to see morality as a science, we'll need to do both of these. Define and better understand human mental evolution, which I'm calling psychohistory. And we need to create a structure of first principles and connections to form the periodic table equivalent for morality, which I'm calling the prime radiant. Morality claims to answer many of the following questions, but it does so badly. If morality were scientific, the answers would be much better and more useful. Here are some of the questions we expect morality to answer. Why are some people so mean? Is God real? If God exists, why does God allow our world to go on like it does? Why does war happen? Why can't we live in peace? Why are so many people depressed and suicidal? What makes me happy? Why am I so lonely? Here are some questions related to Maslow's hierarchy. How can I find a good place to live? How can I get the basics? Food, clean water, safety, clothing, and other aspects of basic physical comfort. How can I get emotional and sexual satisfaction? How can I esteem myself and others? How can I achieve self-actualization? Then we have some political questions. Why does education suck? Why are roads managed so poorly? Why does the government make it so hard for business and for entrepreneurs? Why are our political leaders so consistently bad and disappointing? Why are campaign promises so rarely fulfilled? And with such a failure rate, why are we so anxious and determined at each new election? Why do we fear our own cops and military, our lawyers and judges, the very ones we've hired to protect us? Why are taxes, legal complexity, prices, drug use, and bureaucratic inefficiencies always on the rise? Why are economists so much more useless than meteorologists? How can I live free? What else can we do? This last question I heard a lot and has been a major motivator for me. I want to have a good answer when I hear someone ask, what else can we do? It was asked of me many times, and asked in despair no less, by my construction customers regarding the challenges of dealing with the U.S. government. I'd hear it nearly every time when our discussion turned to taxes, licensing, and building regulations. It was one of the things that drove me to seek an answer for them. It was one of the many things that helped me to realize the sorry condition of our understanding of morality. When we ask these and similar questions, usually a moral expert appears to provide answers. The strange contradiction of so many confusing moral questions combined with the existence of so many moral experts is a real puzzle. How can we be so confused and yet so certain? I've referenced the moral problem and the moral question above. The moral problem is how I refer to the current state of the study of morality. The moral problem is analogous to what we might have called the geology, chemistry, or physics problem at the scientific early days of those fields. It's not a specific moral question, but the question of the state of our understanding of the subject. The geology problem that existed at the inception of the science of geology was the lack of understanding of the fundamental principles of geology. How old was the earth? 
Was it made in seven days by a god? Has the earth always looked as it does? If not God, then how were mountains, oceans, and continents formed? What is continental drift? Although they hadn't even asked that question. How do fossils of fish end up in mountains? How quickly does erosion happen? How did the planet form? What's under the surface of the earth? This state of affairs was what we could call the geological problem, or the geology problem. So many first principles of geology were yet to be understood or even suspected at the beginning of the science of geology. It's wonderful to look now at the progress and at all the questions that progress has inspired. The science of geology is now well established, thanks in part to a bunch of rich European men with free time and interest in the subject back in the 1800s. The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen comes to mind. Their interest in these questions, which we now categorize as geological questions, combined with the amazing work of individual geological thinkers before them, led to the formation and progress of the scientific approach to the understanding of geology. The chemistry problem, as it existed a few centuries ago, was, as with geology, a lack of understanding of first principles. The standards of chemical nomenclature were almost non-existent. Different names for the same chemical compounds and even elements were used all over the world. The existence of elements and atoms was theorized and questioned, but not well understood. It wasn't until the Renaissance, and again the, pro the progress of men and women with money, time, and interest, that individual elements began to be isolated. Individual theorists began to form ideas of how observable aspects of nature were related, such as pressure and temperature, and how these things affected various compounds and elements. Enthusiasts in the field began to collaborate and to unify nomenclature. Then the great breakthrough, Mendeleev's periodic table of elements arrived, providing a beautifully accurate structure of relationships and predictions for existing and theoretical elements. The usefulness of the scientific method gained more and more acceptance as the repeatability of chemical experiments was seen. From our 2021 view, the progress of the acceptance of chemistry as a science and of chemistry's scientific progress is truly astounding. We have inherited duct tape, superglue, and yellow dye number five, among many other marvels. No one today doubts that chemistry is a valid field of scientific study. The physics problem, as it existed centuries ago, was similar. Thanks to Sir Isaac Newton, the world benefited from some of the key first principles of physics. Newton's three laws of motion, not to mention his introduction of the new mathematical study of calculus, took the intellectual and industrial world by storm. But many of physics' first principles were unknown, even though what was known was extremely useful. Then came Albert Einstein, and the foundation of physics were shaken to their core. With the introduction of specific and general relativity and the quantum physical theory that resulted, the scientific method received a jolt of amazed admiration. Never was it better understood that the rigorous process of hypothesis, testing, theorizing, and a near-religious respect for truth could affect and expand our understanding of the world and universe in which we live. Physics today is quite a humble science. In perhaps no other field of scientific inquiry will you find scientists who so freely admit to their need to understand, to research, and to imagine first principles of their field. So much evidence exists for the power of scientific experiment in the field of physics, yet at the same time, the more that is learned, the more we are told we have yet to learn. Physics is a science. The two words are almost synonyms. Morality is not a science in the same way as these. 
Yes, you can major in ethics and philosophy in most colleges across the world, but who is there that can claim the title of moral scientist? The best you can aspire to today is professor of ethics or great philosopher. We don't know how to think yet in terms of moral science. Why is that? The questions listed above have been asked for decades and some of them for as long as people have been living together. There are also multitudes who claim to have the answers, while other multitudes will get in line to tell you that there are no answers or that only God has them. Morality is the hottest topic of humanity. There's so much interest in it, yet so much control and emotion attached to it, that anyone honestly looking at the subject and wondering why there isn't more progress must become suspicious. The harder we look, the more scientific the approach, the more it becomes clear that in this one field of human interest, there is clearly foul play. There are many factors that I want to discuss with this content. To stay organized, I'm going to lean heavily on the two terms I referenced above. Psychohistory, as a way of perceiving and understanding human mental evolution, will be a useful tool for examining the moral problem. The prime radiant is something that I'll do my best to outline, at least conceptually, as it doesn't exist yet. It would be a first principles approach and a structure of connected relationships that I hope can do for morality what the periodic table did for chemistry. A third tool I would like to invoke is what I'm calling quantum morality. I want to take advantage of the lessons learned from the birth of the science of physics. When Einstein's theory of relativity showed that Newton's classical understanding of the physical laws governing the universe were not complete, or were emergent properties of more fundamental principles, it shook the physics world. Albert Einstein himself spent the rest of his life looking for a unifying principle that could tie together the classical view of physics with the quantum view he had helped discover. I believe that a similar divide exists in the field of morality. Our psychohistory, or our human mental evolution, has granted us a classical view of morality. In fact, it's so classical that it's the only view. And we don't have a moral Einstein, sort of. Actually, we do. We have Etienne de la Bautier, or however you pronounce his name. We have Ayn Rand. We have Aristotle. We have Murray Rothbard, Mark Stevens, Stefan Molyneux, Lys Lysander Spooner, and so many more. We have inherited a vast library of Einstein-esque thinking on the subject. In fact, there are so many Einsteins of morality that we get lost, and their wisdom sits unlearned and unapplied. This is another red flag that shouts to the student of morality, foul play. If so many brilliant minds either couldn't grasp moral principles or were not allowed to speculate or to apply their theories, then the subject must truly be incomprehensible or very dangerous. I believe that the existence of so many moral experts, both acknowledged and self-proclaimed, lends credence to the theory that morality can be well understood and that it is a valid subject for scientific inquiry. On the other hand, the existence of so much suppression of and resistance against any attempt to apply moral theories that don't support the party line lends credence to the theory that morality is foremost among fields of human interest whose scientific progress has been deliberately and ruthlessly halted. Quantum morality is the phrase I'd like to use as an alternative view of morality. While this view is not entirely new, it still needs to be newly organized and packaged for general peer review and, hopefully, acceptance as a valid view of fundamental principles of morality. The classical, present, view of morality, which I'll try to properly outline later on, I hope to show as a set of emergent properties. I want to show that our inherited, classical view of morality is emergent from more fundamental principles, 
principles I'll describe in my later explanation of quantum morality. Morality, ethics, philosophy, and religion are claimed by many to hold answers to the above questions. The consensus seems to reject these answers as inconsistent. The level of certainty of those who claim answers to those questions seems to rise inversely with the level of evidence or adherence to the scientific method. Epistemology is the science of how we know what we know. For ages there was only one epistemological approach, that of faith. We might call this, quote, classical epistemology, unquote, as opposed to modern or um, quantum epistemology. The application and acceptance of the scientific method over the centuries has introduced a second epistemological approach, and that is the approach of science, or the use of the scientific method. Epistemology may be the most well-established branch of scientific research that you've never heard of. It suffers from the prejudice of those who follow the classical epistemological approach of faith. To them, there's no science of epistemology. There's just faith. But the scientific community is growing, and growing ever faster with the advent of the internet. Today, the understanding and acceptance of the science of epistemology go hand in hand with the understanding and acceptance of the scientific method as the only reliable approach to the application of human curiosity. There are many who are caught in the middle, perhaps having heard of epistemology and maybe even accepting it as a valid science while still embracing the epistemology of faith. They are the vast chunk of humanity who have been taught and have accepted the contradiction that the scientific method is truly the only valid approach for the application of human interest, except in the realm of the mystical or the moral. For them, they've been taught to believe science applies to this world, but there exists another world, the heavens, eternity, or the spiritual, or some other term describing a universe where fact, evidence, and the rigorous testing of such do not apply and cannot apply. In that universe, only faith applies. Unfortunately, this is the mindset of most religious people. For them, the two epistemological approaches are not contradictory. For them, the universe is a contradiction. One part, the apparently real part, exists where logic, experiment, facts, and vast uncertainty managed by steady, honest scientific inquiry is the valid approach. The other part, the metaphysical, the spiritual, or the really real, is separate and operated on mostly incomprehensible rules, rules which are not susceptible to scientific inquiry and must be managed and taken exclusively on faith. Morality and epistemology are linked in this way. Epistemology won't be fully accepted as a science until we solve or begin to solve the moral problem. Until morality is accepted as a science, epistemology will remain untaught to vast swaths of humanity and will remain unaccepted in its entirety by those who know of it yet are caught in the trap of religion. This classic epistemological trap is a detriment not only to the field of morality, but for all scientific inquiry in general, as a failure to accept modern or the quantum-style version of epistemology means a limit to the scientific method of inquiry, and so is a great mental handicap. If you're a religious person, I ask your patience. You will see me as a heathen, confused, and unenlightened I mean no offense, and for those of you religious-minded, yet generous, I know you won't take offense, but please keep your mind open to the idea that morality as a science is possible. My goal with this content, through an explanation of psychohistory, or our mental ev evolution, is to provide a rational alternative to the narrative you've been taught, and which you deeply accept as your true religious belief. I ask that you give me the chance to apply the scientific method to your religious belief. 
Two quotes for your consideration. It ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. Mark Twain. And, if we have the truth, it cannot be harmed by investigation. If we have not the truth, it ought to be harmed. J. Reuben Clark. So, with the use of these three tools, psychohistory, which is the study of humanity's mental evolutionary journey and potential, with the prime radiant, which is an ambitious tool to be hammered out into existence partly with this content, providing a periodic table-style structure for the scientific approach of morality, and our third tool, quantum morality, the fundamental nature and principle-based foundation for the classical morality we've all inherited. With these three tools, I hope to make some serious progress in jump-starting the science of morality to life. This will also be a recruitment tool for all you aspiring moral scientists and technologists to bring your two cents and join the fight to break morality out of jail and add it to the growing list of expanding human scientific inquiry and knowledge. Isaac Asimov's Prime Radiant was a small handheld cube which, when activated, would replace one's view of their immediate environment with a projection of psychohistorical formula and calculations. I have some idea of how a periodic table for morality le might look, and it may end up being so much more complex than the structure of atoms and their relationships that we may need Asimov's third dimension, perhaps with the fourth dimension of time thrown in as well. It's a fun project, and I can't wait to live in a world with a functioning prime radiant. That wraps up this episode. Thank you for your interest, and I'll see you in the next video.